electrical stimulation in patients with foot drop. Uh, so just some objectives, what I'm going to go over, talk about foot drop, uh, the gait cycle, because foot drop is a pathological gait, um, the muscles and nerves involved in dorsiflexion, some physical exam findings, yeah, um, some physical exam findings, um, differential diagnosis, treatment options, uh, then I'm going to focus on neuromuscular electrical stimulation and uh, functional electrical stimulation. Uh, I focused on one foot drop system uh, called NESS L300. And then I'll talk about a few other uh, foot drop systems and some studies and then conclusion. Uh, so foot drop. So this is a deceptively simple name for a pretty complex problem. Um, <clears throat> it could be characterized by gait abnormality involving the dropping of the forefoot uh, due to the inability to dorsiflex to clear the floor. Uh, this could be due to like irritation of the common peroneal nerve, the sciatic nerve, uh, paralysis of the muscles in the anterior portion of the lower leg. Um, it's a cause of multiple falls and injuries um, every year, and the male to female ratio is 2.8 to 1. Um, and it's said that it was equally affects both legs. Uh, so the gait cycle, just like a brief overview. Uh, so um, it's a single sequence of function of one limb, uh, which is referred to as a stride. So stride is compromised of two steps. Uh, and it's composed of two phases. So the stance phase, which uh, compromises 60% of the gait cycle, um, and that's um, and that's split into five time periods. So initial contact, loading response, mid stance, terminal stance, and pre swing. Um, and during this, the pretibial muscles uh, that affect dorsiflexion are active during initial contact and loading response. Uh, swing is forty percent of the gait cycle. Um, and this is a time period in which the foot is in the air for limb advancement, and this is divided into three periods, initial swing, mid-swing, terminal swing, um, and the pretibial muscles are concentrically active throughout this entire phase. Um, so as a pathological gait, um, there's weakness of the pretibial muscles, um, and like I previously said, which are both active in swing and stance. So in stance, uh, you'll see a foot slap during initial contact and loading response. And this is because, uh, like I previously mentioned, um, the pretibial muscles are eccentrically active uh, during those two periods. Um, and during initial contact in a normal person, the ground reaction vector passes behind the ankle and knee center, which causes the foot to plant our flex. So if you don't have this eccentric lengthening um, to control the action, foot slap will occur. Um, and in the swing phase, the pretibial muscles are concentrically active to help clear the floor while advancing the limb. So you'll see toe drag. Um, you can also see some compensatory techniques like circumduction, steppage gait, uh, hip hiking, and vaulting uh, in patients who do have foot drop. Uh, so just some anatomy about the muscles that are involved. Um, the primary muscles involved in dorsiflexion are the tibialis anterior. Um, you can see it. Um, the ex extensor digitorum longus. Uh, secondary muscles are the peroneus tertius longus brevis um, and the extensor hallucis longus. And these are innervated by the common peroneal nerve. Um, and we know that the L4S2 roots continue on as a sciatic nerve, which then splits into the perineal and tibial. Um, and in the posterior thigh, the common perineal nerve innervates the short head of the biceps femoris. Um, and then when it goes behind the fibular head, it splits into the deep and superficial portions. Uh, the superficial perineal nerve innervates the perineus longus, brevis, and provides uh, cutaneous sensation to the lateral leg. Um, and the deep perineal nerve innervates the tibialis anterior, extensor digitorum longus, extensor 
uh, perineus tertius, tertius and provides cutaneous sensation to the first dorsal interossea. So physical exam, um, obviously you need a comprehensive history to see um, you know, what may be causing the foot drop. Um, and then upon gait examination, like I said, you can see toe drag. Patients are gonna be unable to walk on their heels. Um, you'll see the compensatory techniques, step edge gait, vaulting, circumduction, hip hiking, and on range of motion testing, uh, you may notice that they may not have normal range of dorsiflexion, which is 20 degrees. So differential diagnosis. Um, there's a wide, you know, uh, differential here. So um, L4, L5 radiculopathy could be one. A mononeuropathy of the common peroneal nerve. Um, actually, um, I read that a lot of patients who come in with this um, uh, complaint have a behavioral habitual crossing of their legs. And because of that, they're compressing their common perineal nerve. So you can just um, treat that by telling them to simply avoid crossing their legs. Um, if it's bilateral, you can think of like a polyneuropathy, uh, something, um, some of the causes are like diabetes, um, alcohol abuse, toxins, Lyme disease, HIV. Um, it could be a central cause like a brain tumor, CVA, AVM, spinal cord injury. Um, it could be due to an anterior tibial tendon rupture, uh, spasticity of the gastroc and soleus, um, a double crush phenomenon, which could be like a patient already has pre-existing um, pathology um, and they um, undergo another insult, like someone who has a history of spinal stenosis and then they undergo total hip arthroplasty for their irritating the nerve. And um, <clears throat> EMG nerve conduction study can um, provide you with further information. So treatment options. Uh, so of course we can uh, provide patients with physical therapy. Um, the standard um, is an ankle foot orthotic, uh, functional electrical stimulation, which we'll talk more about, and surgery uh, for a patient who may have like an anterior uh, tendon rupture, you can get a tendon transfer. Some patients have nerve transfers. Um, Okay, and so just a little bit about ankle foot orthotics. So uh, there's plastic molded, which is, uh, so one of them is the solid type, um, and the trim line can be, you know, anterior to the malleoli or posterior to the malleoli, depending on how much stability the patient needs. Um, and the trim line and the design of the foot plate uh, determine the structural support and rigidity of the device. Uh, then there's the posterior leaf spring AFO, um, and this is just a thin plastic band behind the ankle uh, with patients who have more medial lateral stability of their ankle. Um, then there's articulated, um, and this has a dorsiflexion assistance or a posterior plantar flexion stop. Or there's hybrid, which is a plastic metal articulated. Uh, and this could have a single channel to provide dorsiflexion assist plantar flexion stopper both, or a dual channel, posterior channel, and anterior channel. Um, then there's uh, metal ankle foot orthotics, and as you can see, they're heavier weight, less cosmetic appeal, but they are useful in patients with risk of excessive pressure or skin breakdown, uh, patients who have fluctuating edema, or um, insensate foot due to neuropathy. Or nerve injury. Um, so now we'll talk a little bit about neuromuscular electrical stimulation. So this is the process of applying electrical stimulation above the motor threshold to cause a muscle contraction. Um, it can be therapeutic, so just to minimize atrophy and maintain range of motion and paralyze muscle, or it could be functional. Um, so this can assist muscle contraction to favor functional tasks, um, such as walking and foot drop. Um, and this can be an open or closed loop system. So an open loop would be when the stimulation is triggered manually. Um, so that would be like the therapist actively, um, you know, pressing the switch while the patient's walking and watching them. Um, or it could be a closed loop, which is 
very sophisticated, um, using like automated technology and electrodes and sensors to um, sense the gait cycle and activate based on how the patient is moving uh, their extremity. So, this is weird. Um, some history on electrical stimulation. So, I don't know where the first part is gone. But, um, so mm -hmm. it dates back to 400 BC. I know it's not up there, I don't know why. Um, but they were using torpedo fish, which could, uh, they had paired electrical organs. And um, they were using that back then to treat like a wide variety of conditions like from headaches to hemorrhoids, I think they said. Um, and then there's another one in 1744, but it's not up there. It's not here. Um, I think that was the first, oh no, that's here. Okay. Um, and then in 1831, um, Faraday, why is it so weird? Um, constructed an electromagnetic machine, and this is uh, the basis of a lot of the FES systems used nowadays. Um, and then in 1840, um, electrical stimulation of muscles began um, as a diagnostic tool. And in 1961, uh, Dr. Lieberson, he was the first to report a practical application of um, <clears throat> in rehabilitation in patients with foot drop. So for uh, us to use neuromuscular electrical stimulation on a patient, they require an intact motor unit. So lower motor neuron, a neuromuscular junction, and muscle fibers that are all intact. Um, and actually, if you um, apply stimulation directly to the muscle fiber, it is 100 to 1,000 times higher than nerve fiber stimulation. So this is why we can't do this safely. Um, and it's best suited for upper motor neuron disease to induce muscle activation in paretic muscles. So if we have this intact motor unit, uh, just a little bit about how it's recruited. So the threshold for excitation for an externally applied current is actually inversely proportional to the nerve fiber diameter, which is opposite of normal volitional muscle contraction. So in normal muscle contraction, the motor units with low conduction velocity, slow twitch force, um, a longer contraction time, lower force generation, and greater resistance to fatigue are recruited first. And these are the smaller units. Um, and then the motor units with higher conduction vo velocity, greater force generation, and less resistance to fatigue are recruited after, so the larger ones. So using um, NMES, we're recruiting the larger ones first. And this can pose as a challenge because patients can experience abrupt force generation or rapid onset of fatigue. Um, and this can really only be partially compensated by adjusting the stimulation parameters of the system itself. So it's something to think about if you see a patient with this. Uh, so just some physiology behind uh, the production of a muscle contraction. Um, so in an external device, you know, you stimulate an electrode which produces an electrical field, which causes depolarization to reach its threshold. And we'll talk about this a little um, right after this, the action potential is produced, uh, which travels to the neuromuscular junction, um, causing the contraction of muscle fibers. So here I just have um, a little chart of action potential, and you see at the bottom, the stimulus is provided, and once it reaches threshold, the sodium is um, moving from extracellular to intracellular, causing depolarization, um, and this is just what's occurring down the axon uh, while the action potential is being is traveling down to the neuromuscular junction. And here we see at the top the action potential is coming down that motor neuron um, into the neuromuscular junction. And here you can see um, once the action potential arrives, uh, calcium enters the axon terminal, and this causes acetylcholine to be released, uh, which diffuses 
um, into the sarcolemma and it binds to open channels that causes sodium to go into the muscle fiber and potassium to go out. Um, and then acetylcholine is terminated by acetylcholine esterase. And here now we're at uh, the muscle and you can see the acetylcholine here coming down the action potential as uh, propagated down the sarcolemma. Again, calcium is released, um, and the calcium binds to the troponin, which causes the troponin to change shape, um, removing the blocking action of the tropomyosin, and the actin active sites are exposed, which causes the contraction. Um, and then after the action potential ends, calcium is uh, removed, and the tropomyosin blockage is restored and the muscle fiber relaxes. Uh, so now we'll talk about a few, uh, I'll just go over a few peroneal nerve uh, functional electrical stimulation systems. So there are three externally uh, FDA approved systems currently. One is called the odd stock drop foot stimulator, uh, the walk aid and the Bioness L300, which is the one I'll talk about. Um, and then we have the implanted systems, uh, which are available in Europe. I'm not sure if they're available here. Uh, Stimustep and ActiGate. And so these are all closed loop systems um, that uh, can sense a gate cycle and stimulate uh, when needed. Um, the walk aid actually uses a tilt sensor, so it has um, the sensor is be below the knee. Um, and these patients need sufficient knee flexion during swing phase so that the sensor can um, detect that movement. And this is, um, so this allows patients to like walk barefoot or use different, you know, types of shoes. Uh, while the L300 we'll talk about more has a heel pressure sensor. Uh, so just some of the differences between external and implanted. Uh, the external ones are more commonly used, they're more available, they have a lower cost, um, they're non-invasive um, and safer. And the implanted ones, um, more reliable electrode placement, um, obviously after surgery. Um, you have the capacity to selectively stimulate deeper structures whereas the external ones really can only uh, stimulate something that's more um, on the surface. You don't need to don and doff any components. Uh, there are reports of less stimulation-induced pain, and um, it's used uh, greater practicality for interventions that require a larger number of stimulation channels. Uh, so, Functional electrical stimulation is believed to affect neural repair secondary to use-dependent plasticity. Uh, they believe that repeated movements can reinforce network patterns, um, and it may lead to enhanced synaptic connections. Uh, there was one study done by um, Hara et al., and they used a multi-channel near-infrared spectroscopy study, which measured hemoglobin levels in the brain during FES. And they found that cerebral blood flow in the sensory motor cortex on the injured side was higher during FES session than during simple active movement or just simple um, therapeutic electrical stimulation. So before we talk about some of uh, the foot drop systems, I just uh, found this article, which was pretty interesting. Uh, Ramsey et al., um, he studied post-stroke tibialis anterior muscular architecture. So he used MRI and ultrasound to find out if um, the dorsiflexion muscle weakness post-stroke is primarily neurological or are there some uh, morphological changes that contribute. Uh, so he used 10 patients, 8 males, 2 females, they were 61 plus or minus 10 years, and they were 52 plus or minus 40 months since stroke, so like 1 to 8 years out. Um, he used MRI to measure the anterior muscle volume and muscle belly length, and he used ultrasound to measure the fascicle length and the pination angle in neutral position. And the fascicle length and pination angle are two architectural parameters that can influence how much muscle, how much 
how a muscle can generate force. Um, and he found no statistical difference between the paretic and non paretic limb, as you can see here for um, all of the parameters. And so he concluded that uh, these patients have the muscular capacity to dorsiflex their foot. So treating them solely by increasing muscle mass is not effective because there's no atrophy or architectural difference. Uh, so he recommended that um, um, use to address this neurological impairment. Um, okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about one foot drop system in particular, the NESS L300. Uh, this was FDA approved in 2008, um, and it has three main components, which you can see here in the picture, that communicate via radio frequency signals. Uh, so you have the lightweight L300 functional stimulation cuff, which is strategically placed over uh, the perineal nerve in this system. Uh, to apply the stimulus. Um, then we have the IntelliSense gate sensor, which you see there on his um, sock. Um, and this is to detect the heel on and heel off position. And it uses an algorithm to communicate with the system to induce dorsiflexion at the appropriate time during swing phase and early stance phase for the exact duration um, and it can help um, navigate when there are changes in elevation or walking speeds. Uh, the third is the wireless portable control unit. You can see in his hand there. And uh, this is a handheld remote to turn the system on and off. Uh, you can select the operating modes here. You can see that they have a gate mode for use in walking or there's a therapeutic training mode for just muscle training. Um, and you can use uh, this unit to uh, fine-tune stimulation necessities. Um, and it also interfaces with the clinician's programmer. So it allows the clinician to set parameters, make adjustments, um, track gait history, and monitor patient compliance. <coughs> so just some guidelines for using the Ness L300. They give you a whole packet of skincare guidelines to ensure healthy skin with long-term use. Uh, this is because, as you can see, adverse effects, uh, the most prominent adverse effect is skin irritation. Um, pressure sores, um, an increase in muscle spasticity, heart-related stress, lower extremity ed edema, um, among these are just a few that I named. Um, and then contraindications are a demand type cardiac pacemaker, uh, patients with defibrillators, any electrical met metallic implant, um, any cancerous lesion, um, any sort of regional disorder of the limb like a fracture um, are contraindications for use. Um, so just a little bit about the cost. Um, it's estimated around $6,000 per device. Uh, it can be rented for $500 a month. Um, it's not covered by Medicare, and it's variable coverage among insurance companies. Uh, so here we have a study in 2006. So this is before um, it was actually FDA approved. Um, and they studied 24 patients with chronic hemiparesis. And there was 21 post-stroke patients and three post-TBI patients. And they measured gait variability, asymmetry, velocity, and the number of falls. And patients were also provided with a subjective questionnaire to evaluate their satisfaction. Um, so here we can see um, the first one on the left, top left, is gait variability. And you can see that it decreases by 33%. Um, gait asymmetry also decreased, gait velocity increased, uh, the blue line is on just um, an even flat floor, and the pink line is um, on a floor with obstacles. And so, um, and here we have total number of falls, and you can see it went from 24 to 2. Um, and in terms of the questionnaire, people found that 
the system was safer for use. They reported an increase in physical activity with greater confidence. Um, and the majority of them reported not needing help in operating the system and didn't find it difficult to place the orthoses in the correct position. Um, and here we have the FASTEST trial, which stands for Functional Ambulation Standard Treatment versus Electrical Stimulation Treatment. Uh, this was done by Cluding et al. in 2012. So this is a multi-center, randomized, single, blinded trial uh, that compared AFOs and the NES L300 um, in chronic stroke patients with a gait speed less than or equal to 0 0.8 meters per second. And they measured the immediate effect, training effect, therapeutic, and total effect. And so here I just included the eligibility criteria because it's very similar for all of the other um, studies I'm gonna talk about as well. And so here you can see that most of these patients have had at least one stroke for uh, more than three months before the study started. Uh, they do have ankle dorsiflexion response to the stimulator in sitting and standing. They're medically stable. Um, they scored over a 24 in the mini mental exam, or they have a competent caregiver. Uh, they're greater than 18 years of age, um, able to walk more than 10 meters uh, with a maximum of one person assist. And for this one specifically, they wanted a gait speed less than 0.8 meters per second. Um, exclusion criteria also very similar for many of the other studies. If they have a fixed ankle contracture of more than five degrees of plantar flexion, um, if they have pain affecting the leg uh, greater than four on a 10 point scale, if they're involved in any other um, PTOT exercise program or other trial, uh, if they've had Botox, um, if I can't read. Um, if they've had hemisensory loss um, or if they've used any FDS system in the past um, or if they have any implants, like I said, some of the um, exclusion, uh, the contraindications for an FES system. So for this, 60% uh, of these patients were provided with a new or modified AFO and they were split into the AFO and um, treatment group. They had eight sessions of physical therapy. The first two to four sessions focused on education of the device, um, initiating gait training, and an individualized home exercise program. The control group also received um, a transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation at each PT session. Um, and uh, the outcomes were measured at baseline six, 12, and 30 weeks. And so here we have uh, the primary outcome they used was a 10 meter walking test. Um, and comfortable gait speed and fast gait speed improved significantly with both the AFO and FES system. But there was no difference between the groups for the speed, for speed found. Uh, secondary outcomes, they used the Fugelmeyer time up and go, six minute walk test, Berg balance. Um, significant improvements in both groups, but Again, no difference between the groups. Uh, fall questionnaires, they did report a greater number of falls in the control group, but there was still no statistical difference between the groups. Um, and skin and adverse effect, adverse events, 59% um, adverse effects were reported in the treatment group related to the device or procedure, and 40% were skin related, um, and 35% in the control group. Uh, satisfaction questionnaire, patients reported they were significantly um, more satisfied in the treatment group. So they questioned why was there no significant, significant difference between the two groups. Uh, so like I said, multiple patients received new and modified AFOs. Um, the control group also received TENS treatment. Uh, it could be due to the increase in peripheral muscle strength. Uh, could it be due to neuroplasticity, um, improved cardiopulmonary condition? And they said the single most important factor um, was patient compliance. And since they were involved in this trial and that they had the home exercises,
this could be the reason why everyone did well. Um, here we have another study um, in 2013. Uh, they just looked at five hemiplegic patients. Uh, four were with cerebral palsy and one with uh, diffuse pontine glioma. And here they used uh, these gait indices, so the gait profile score and the gait deviation index and Gillette gait index. Um, and if you look at the parameters, the gait deviation index and gait profile score are exactly the same. And they both significantly improved. Um, and the Gillette gait index showed improvement, but it was not significant. And at one year follow-up with these patients, uh, they expressed high satisfaction. Um, and the mean age of these patients was act actually 16.5 years. Uh, they had a lot of young patients with cerebral palsy. Um, here we have another study by Swigchim. Um, and he used the NES L300 in um, 26 community dwelling chronic stroke patients, so um, at least three to six months out, who were previously using AFOs. And their walking speed was monitored at baseline two weeks and eight weeks. Um, and the AFO and NES L300 equally were, were equally effective in walking speed and activity level. Um, again, patients report increased satisfaction with the NES L300, um, but as you can see again, there was no increase in walking speed um, compared to the AFO, so indicating that the, L the FES did not have a therapeutic benefit. Um, another study by Swig Chem in 2012. And here he studied um, obstacle avoidance because they had proposed that gait speed may not be the limiting factor uh, with regard to independent and safe walking um, and that uh, obstacle avoidance attributes greatly. Uh, so here we have 26 patients with stroke at least six months prior um, and they had 30 obstacles released in front of them. Um, in one of three phases, mid stance, late stance to early swing, or mid swing. And this correlated with um, available response time of 450 to 600 seconds, 300 to 450, and 150 to 300 seconds, respectively. Um, here we see um, their setup and the obstacle at the bottom. Um, two patients dropped out of this. One patient dropped out due to severe discomfort from stimulation prior to week two. Uh, one dropped out due to uh, developing an allergic skin reaction, which was dermatologically confirmed um, at the electrode site at week three. And here you can see the success rates were higher in FES with obstacle avoidance versus the AFO. Um, and reducing the ART, so um, when they, uh, at what time they uh, put the obstacle out, increase the level of difficulty. And here they found that patients with relatively low muscle strength were more likely to benefit from the FES compared to patients who had more strength. Um, okay, so here we're moving on to uh, some of the other um, foot drop systems. This one talks about the walk aid, which is also an external um, device. So here in 2012, they studied um, the use of the walk aid versus the AFO uh, with 20 sessions of PT. Um, the primary outcome measures, again, was time spent to walk 10 meters uh, walking distance. And um, secondary outcome measures included functional ambulation classification, the Barthel index, riverhead mobility, muscle strength, uh, neurological scale and Ashworth scale. And here for the primary outcomes, so the walking speed was increased 168% in the walk aid group and 129% in the AFO. Uh, secondary outcomes all were significantly improved uh, that I previously mentioned except for the Ashworth score. It was higher in the FES group but just not statistically significant. Um, and they suggested that um, there was an activation of the motor cortical areas 
and their residual descending connections to help explain the therapeutic effects on walking speed. So going back to that neural repair. Um, here we have, this is um, an implanted foot drop stimulator, the ActiGate, uh, done by Burridge in 2007. Um, and once again, since it's an implanted system, it avoids the inconvenience of donning and doffing, uh, positioning the electrodes in the correct position, and skin irritation. Um, so the implant cuff is placed around the common perineal nerve just proximal to its bifurcation into the deep and superficial branches. And the um, stimulator body is placed in the lateral femoral fascia posterior to the cuff. So this study had 15 patients, two required reimplantation, and then they re-entered the study. Um, and then again, two more required reimplantation. And then one uh, whose medical condition deteriorated had to drop out. Um, and what, so at the end, there was uh, 12 patients who were involved in the study. Uh, and one again re-entered, and one was still awaiting reimplantation. So he, yeah. Uh, so here we have um, the primary outcome of the walking speed and distance walked in four minutes. And you can see that um, it did increase with um, more significantly with the um, stimulation, with the um, implanted device. Um, and the range of ankle dorsiflexion also increased on average to 20 degrees lying and sitting for these patients. And they also performed nerve conduction studies uh, to see if this um, uh, affected the nerve. Uh, so they did it pre-implantation and 90 days post-implantation, and uh, no nerve damage had occurred. Uh, next, we have a study by Kesar et al. in 2009, um, and they didn't specify which uh, system they used, but what they did was uh, they wanted to see the effect of delivering uh, surface FES to both ankle dorsiflexors and plantar flexors versus just the dorsiflexor, dorsiflexors alone. Uh, so they had two foot switches that were attached bilaterally to the soles of the feet uh, on the forefoot and hind foot. And these were all also chronic post-stroke patients. So um, the dorsiflexion stimulation uh, allowed the patients to achieve neutral ankle joint position. And the stimulation uh, for this um, group was delivered from the time the forefoot switch of the paretic foot was off the floor until the hind foot switch contacted the ground. And for the plantar flexion and stimulation, they used two different time logics for when they uh, applied the stimulus. So first logic was the trigger uh, was given when the hind foot switch was off the ground of the paretic limb to the time the forefoot was off the ground. And the second logic was when the trigger from the non paretic forefoot switch contacted the ground until the forefoot switch of the paretic foot was off the ground. So what they found was that um, applying FES to the ankle dorsiflexors alone uh, corrected the swing phase drop foot. Uh, it actually decreased knee flexion 8%, um, and it decreased ankle plantar flexion at toe-off. Mm -hmm. So that's also um, a little concerning because if you're um, applying this dorsiflexion stimulus, it could negatively impact um, the ankle plantar flexion, which we need at toe-off. Um, and then we have the FES to ankle plantar and dorsiflexors. And uh, one of the main findings they found was it increased forward propulsion um, and uh, by 18%. So you can see that in the PDF group, uh, it increased to 33%. And in the DF, it was 31%. Uh, and this increased knee flexion, 8.6%. And, I'll, but, it decreased dorsiflexion, ang the angle. So here we're seeing that um, 
the dorsiflexion angle is reduced. And so they would require greater dorsiflexion stimulation to generate the same dorsiflexion in the, um, in the group that only got the dorsiflexion stimulus. Um, so this is, I believe, the last um, study that we'll go over. So Scheffler et al. in 2013, and he again uh, just studied uh, the effect of FES and, uh, versus AFO on uh, a few different kinematic, kinetic, and spatiotemporal parameters. So 12 patients were enrolled, and they were further divided into dorsiflexion preserved and dorsi dorsiflexion absent group. Um, and the Vicon motion analysis system was performed to perform gait analysis. Here they found that the stride length significantly improved with FES and the AFO, and walking velocity with the FES was significantly increased um, versus with AFO in the subset of patients that still had some preservation of the dorsiflexion. But if the dorsiflexion size was not considered, uh, walking velocity was not significantly affected. Um, and some kinematic, kinematic pattern parameters. Wow. Um, so dorsiflexion at initial contact was reported better with AFO versus FES. Um, and it was also further increased um, in the subset of patients with dorsiflexion preserved. Um, and so they had hypothesized that FES could induce a flexor withdrawal response. And so they measured peak hip flexion, knee flexion, knee extension, and dorsiflexion, uh, but they were unable to induce this uh, withdrawal response. And uh, kin kinetic parameters. Um, and here we see that the power of push-off in this study was increased with FES versus AFO. Uh, so again, they hypothesized many things regarding why the FES was ineffective on dorsiflexion. Uh, things like poor electrode placement, muscle fatigue, uh, lack of precision in the foot switch, um, and suboptimal stimulus, among many others. Um, and so conclusion. Um, FES may improve dorsiflexion during swing in patients with foot drop, which could potentially reduce risk of tripping and falling. Um, and most studies did not find significant differences between AFO and FES. Um, the results were very varying. Um, it can be cost prohibitive, um, as I went over, um, and more trials needed to confirm if it actually has a benefit in recovery from neurological injury. And um, further advancement may yield clinical significant functional outcomes. I have a YouTube video here, but I don't know. So, we don't have to watch them. This is a very positive video about. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, so this is her walking without anything. So let's go down here. Okay, and here she has the braces on. In here, she has them. <laughs> so she looks fantastic now. <laughs> um, oh my gosh.